Hello everyone, Dr. Ames here. This time I'd like to talk to you about recruitment and selection and focus on some of the variances that we'll find in the public and nonprofit sectors. And certainly uh, this information all should generally apply to the private sector. First of all, let's just talk about what recruitment and selection are. I think when most of us uh, consider what the human resource management function is that we think of hiring people. And that's certainly got to be one of the primary functions of the HR manager. And it is so important, much more important than I think many realize that we get it right. Uh, because we're really talking about something that affects the company in a very significant way in many cases. Uh, the one thing uh, is if you don't do a good job here, you get one of the biggest downsides of doing business uh, or conducting operations in the public and nonprofit sector because uh, really you have to be right on top of it. You can't get the wrong people. You can't have turnover. And turnover is expensive and it's time consuming and it sets you back and it doesn't allow you to move ahead strongly. So first of all, you want to get this right. And really, uh, we're talking about the concept of PE fit, personnel environment, uh, whether you get the right person for the job or not. And so we always want to make sure that we, when we do our recruitment, that we keep this in mind. Now, recruitment itself, if we want to define it, is, is simply a process. It, it's one where we're trying to uh, attract and find the qualified candidates to apply for vacant positions we have within an organization. And then selection is really the final stage of the process uh, when we start to make real decisions about who we are going to select for the, the position or the job. Now, those individuals who deliver programs and services uh, in the public and nonprofit sector, uh, those stakeholders who are uh, concerned about what they do and whether they accomplish their missions or not, they want the HR department to plan and find the best people. They want them to select only the most qualified and competent, and they want them to do it with strategic intent. Now, strategic intent is something I've mentioned before, uh, how important it is to establish that the HR function can contribute strategically. And certainly, this is one large area of importance that the HR manager functions in, and it should be done with strategic intent, getting the right people uh, for the right jobs, and also at the same time, keeping a mind on what do you need into the future. So you don't just jump into it blindly. There are some things to do before you begin the recruitment process. Um, you really need to have done by that point uh, a little bit of forecasting to see where you're headed in the future, what's going to be needed and so forth. So uh, certainly the HR manager in any of the sectors is going to need to understand if the future organizational needs require hiring people with KSOCs, the key skills, abilities, and other characteristics we've talked about are different from those who have the job now or uh, that are available for maybe a new position that's opened up. So you, you really do just want to survey the landscape, make sure you know where you stand before you begin. And that makes sense. Uh, that's what a good manager would do in any circumstance. Um, and so first you should start by reviewing the qualifications for the position, um, identify uh, any career patterns that fit within the department or the agency's framework or the private organization. Now, internal recruitment uh, is always a strong way to go because when you recruit from in, uh, from within, you, you build morale for one thing, but you also gain people who are familiar with the operation, understand possibly the industry uh, and so forth. And so it, it does make some certain amount of sense that whenever you can uh, recruit internally, you'll try to. Um, and some public and nonprofit or agencies will give preference to existing employees. And indeed, we find that happens also in the private sector, depending on the culture and attitudes of, of the given organization. The, the good HR manager is going to track the case socks of current employees and to look for those qualified internal candidates. And in fact, this very function of looking to fill vacancies and so forth from internal candidates 
is one of the reasons we gather information that tells us something beyond just the demographics of our current employees. Knowing their hobbies and interests and the increases they've made in their training and their education and so forth allows us to do a much better job of internal recruitment. So we should always consider if we can't find the skills within uh, the organization that we might have to bring in specialized skills uh, from ex external sources. Um, or we might just be looking to broaden our diversity within the, the organization as well. Now, external recruitment is done all the time, of course. Um, an agency in the public sector certainly will recruit from the relevant, uh, relevant labor market, whether it is local, regional, or national. Um, and nonprofits will do that too, depending on their size and the scope of their operations, if they're national or not. Um, and it also depends a lot on how you go about recruiting people, depending on those skills I've talked about that might be required for the position. Now, one thing that we don't talk about much and many don't know about is this idea of recruiting passive candidates. Um, organizations are always looking for great people and uh, a lot of great people are already working somewhere else and they have positive employment. And many of these passive candidates that organizations would consider hiring have records uh, that are exemplary who are satisfied with their work or successful, successful, and they're, they're happy with where they're at. But employers realize that these might be the cream of the crop when you're looking for really good employees and, uh, and with strategic intent, with a, a notion that you want to be highly competitive and so forth. So you want the most qualified job candidates to fill critical roles. And therefore, many employers are targeting passive job seekers because of the lack of those qualified candidates. And it's often done to remain competitive in tight markets and so forth. In fact, a good example here at Westminster College, I, I know of several professors who were recruited out from under us, who were tenured, uh, who enjoyed their work here, uh, were respected and so forth, but they were recruited passively. Uh, they weren't looking for a job, but they were made an offer they couldn't refuse in some respects. And so, this is something that good HR managers are going to be looking around at the competition. Who's working where? And do we have the uh, necessary means to afford to do this or not? Now, one thing that happens a lot when we do recruiting today, regardless of sector, is e-recruitment. In other words, we are online. And it is uh, probably the number one reason organizations use social media uh, is to, whenever possible, recruit some passive candidates. For instance, maybe you can't see someone's Facebook page because of privacy settings, but certainly LinkedIn, many professionals have LinkedIn accounts and those are made public. You don't hide those accounts. You have that account so that you can be found you know, for many reasons. Um, and so those are sources where uh, a smart HR manager will go uh, and so forth. So if you're an HR manager, uh, a public agency, a nonprofit uh, of some type, you can get a little unsolicited help from online job providers as well, uh, such as this one uh, that I show a link for here, usajobs.gov. So for instance, if you're looking for a job in the public sector, um, especially, you can use a place like usajobs.gov. Let me see if I can be successful here in showing you their website. Now here you can see usajobs.gov. Um, just for information's sake, when you see this suffix here, this earl.gov, it's an official government website. So it's not a business, it's not a nonprofit. And so this one here in particular is an informational website set up for the government, by the government uh, to help you find work. Of course, it's gonna be work in the public sector, but uh, look at some of the uh, things that are available to you. You can create a profile, put it on file, set up to get regular notices when jobs come up. You can apply for federal jobs, get help with your resume, upload any kind of documents you want, so forth. Um, and really, a variety of information here is available to you. Students and recent graduates, where could you go to get in somewhere in a public agency? Um, and so if you really 
want to be a manager, but you haven't gotten to where you've decided on a specific career and you're, you're open to doing many things, it certainly wouldn't hurt you to click on something uh, web, uh, informational like this in the website like this one to give yourself a little bit of help and so forth. So certainly, this is uh, where we see a lot of activity. A good HR manager is going to go out there and become familiar with the major job recruiting sites, uh, and in particular, go beyond just a job site, um, find a site that works for public sector, find a site that will help you find candidates in the nonprofit sector, and so forth. Most, most of the job places that you find out there online are actually geared up to help you find private sector jobs, right, in various for-profit organizations. Uh, but if you're looking for a job in any three sectors, expand your horizons a little bit, uh, and you can use many of the same sources of information in different ways. Now, when we recruit for local governments and nonprofits, um, it's a simple process. Review what you need uh, to be done in that any particular job. And so you're looking at the competencies and the skills and the skill levels and so forth of the positions that need to be filled. Um, you look at all of this information and you just simply develop a plan. And of course, it's called a recruitment plan because that's exactly what you're doing. Um, and then take the time to do your homework and find out the best places where you can get the highest visibility. Now, a government website and many of these places will allow you to list job listings for free. Others will charge a fee and, and may want you to uh, sign up or something. But generally, you can get a lot of free unsolicited uh, assistance out there. So post these open positions on websites that are appropriate. Um, and, and certainly, you do have to follow the legal rules. And whenever you go to any of these bulletin board type sites and, and so forth, uh, the rules are there and you can review them and, and make sure. Um, there are a few rules with uh, applicant procedures for internet uh, record keeping and so forth. Uh, the websites will tell you what you need to be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. Now, when we, we come to the marketing idea of it, uh, how do I get my jobs out there? Well, the marketing is really promoting the job vacancy and you have to make sure that everything is accurate, that everything is realistic, and everything is included that's legally required. So you have to have compliance with statements from the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and with EEO, Equal Employment Opportunity, and, and so forth. Um, so you do have to ensure, uh, take the time to make sure all your job postings are available to the appropriate audiences, veterans, disabled, spread a, uh, cast a wide net. The wider you cast your recruitment net, the better chances you are of having a more diverse workforce and getting uh, a better array of talent. So you do have to screen applicants. Recruiting is just the first phase. You start doing things before you recruit and then you recruit with the ads and the marketing and all the rest and the websites and all of that. And then when you start to get responses, that's when you begin screening. And so you're in effect narrowing down your applicant pool. Um, you want to eliminate applicants right away as quickly as possible who don't meet the minimum job requirements. And there are a lot of different ways you can do this. Some organizations actually feed their resumes into a database. They have a software program that looks for keywords and phrases and things like that and eliminates everything that doesn't come up to those uh, particular standards. Uh, but there are different ways to do it. Um, we can scan vitas and resumes alike, keywords, reject or select, uh, like I said. Um, but you can also um, reach mobile users. Um, use career websites, job postings, uh, and a variety of social media like LinkedIn and, and like these other websites in the various sectors and so forth. Or try and find some websites that cater to certain careers. Those are great places to find the right sorts of people with the case knocks that you're looking for. So you just have to use your imagination and creativity a little bit, but be thorough. Any manager who is thorough can get the right information and take the right tact here. You definitely want to use social media. 
And social media can be a very valuable screening tool. And indeed today, there's a lot of research saying this is the direction that HR is going. And, and indeed our entire lives are very much tied up with the internet and the flow of free information back and forth and, and so forth. So uh, SHRM, uh, Society Human Resource Management, did a, a pretty significant survey just a couple of years ago and uh, they found that a third of companies out there have disqualified job candidates because of concerns uh, about something they found on public social media or in an online search. Um, and you might learn something from other places. Social media includes things like blog posts uh, that a candidate, uh, you might find a, a candidate is a good writer, or you may look at a tweet, uh, a tweet account, uh, a Twitter account from some candidate that you've identified. It might just reveal what uh, the person is active in, in charitable causes, or in things that you find objectionable and don't fit with uh, the values of the organization. So ways to include people and also information to eliminate candidates. Um, on the other hand, you may run into a candidate that just seems ideal and they haven't set the privacy settings on their Facebook page, and you find out that they've posted a lot of racist rants. You certainly don't want to have to terminate that employee later because they don't fit the company or they are antithetically opposed to the things and values uh, that the organization stands for. So you have to be savvy as an HR manager and, and do the work. Um, but definitely use social media, public social searches, uh, and the use of these uh, tools is increasing every year and all the time. Um, when it comes to the administrative professional positions, uh, like professional managers, like teachers, like healthcare professionals, um, like architects and engineers, and, and all the sorts of things that are professional. Uh, and we look at the administrative thing, those are really, we're talking about different levels of management and so forth. Um, we do the same things when we're recruiting these types of, of people. You need to have some pre-established criteria for your screening. Um, these positions are going to have detailed and very specific educational and experience requirements almost always. And so you're gonna create checklists uh, that will help you in screening resumes or that you will load into your software program. So you will stay focused on the case socks. Now I've said KSOC several times already uh, in this presentation, and I have in the past. I think that just tells you how important it is for the HR manager to have their focus right there on key skills, abilities, and other characteristics. So you do those things that you need to do. Background investigations, for instance, very common today. And they are common particularly for any type of job in the public sector that involves public safety, uh, or certainly jobs and departments like Homeland Security and the public sector and, and things like that. Um, now these, these uh, background checks are done by various law enforcement agencies. Um, I think there's a procedure depending on the state or the county you're in where you submit requests to local agencies for background checks to the FBI and so forth. It's not hard to find out the procedure and, and to do these things. Um, they do take a little time, but not incredibly uh, a long time. It just depends, uh, really. It could be anything from a week to 10 days to several weeks. It, it really depends on the sector and so forth, I think. Um, but what would they do in these background investigations, actually? Well, they're going to check people's uh, individuals' uh, fingerprint records, criminal histories. Uh, they may do a social media search on identity to see what their reputation is, things like that, depending on the appropriateness of, of the search, depending on the job and so forth. Now, we can also use tools like uh, consumer reports. Um, and these are available out there by various organizations on the internet. And these give us information that we can use uh, to help us. Um, sometimes the Fair Credit Reporting Act Authorize, uh, authorizes uh, organizations to gather consumer credit information about job applicants. So believe it or not, you may not be aware that organizations can check your credit and people do get turned down for good jobs that they're qualified for otherwise because they have a poor credit history. Now, the reason for that could be varied. It might be the position itself requires some sort of financial responsibility. Um, that would indicate that maybe 
you're not as good at that as they would like or something like that. But there, there would probably be a reason they would use some information like that and need to go far enough to want to check your credit. Um, so it is possible that some job applicants could be turned down uh, on the basis of poor credit. But it really does depend on the context of the operations of your agency or organization. Um, now here are some of the screening and selective techniques that you can use. And you can see there are just a lot of these sorts of things out there. Um, it's certainly legal to give people cognitive ability tests. Can you figure out how to do this? Aptitude tests of, of different types, achievement tests, and uh, gather a variety of information. And you can see here, there's all kinds of things. Um, these tests really, when we, we talk about the cognitive ones and the aptitude, they just want to find out if you're smart enough to learn the case ox of the job, if they need to do training to, to bring you up to speed. But it's got to be about that and nothing else. It can't be about what they want to have. It's got to be about what the job demands. That's what keeps it legal. So all kinds of things could be included in these tests. Um, Nonverbal skills could be tested, oral skills, your motor skills, your numerical aptitude, quantitative skills of all type. But the only the ones that apply to the job would legally be mandated or allowed. So companies don't want to waste time and, and money and energy giving you a bunch of tests that aren't needed, right? So the idea is you gather the things that you need from, from employees. Um, the one thing you cannot do is you cannot request their medical history. Um, so keep that in mind, that's illegal. Now, when it comes to achievement tests, these relate to very specific material. Uh, for instance, um, if someone's gonna be hired for an entry level accounting position, it's totally reasonable that you would be asked to do some related exercises or tests to determine if you know basic accounting. Um, the same would be true for any job and that's reasonable. Um, the individual will demonstrate uh, some particular case SOC knowledge pertinent to the job. And that's really where you want to be. Um, the book calls these trade tests, and that's completely accurate. You're getting a test of some type within the context of the job that you're trying to get. Um, when we talk about personality inventories, there's a lot available out there. They're obviously increasing all the time. Their numbers are available in the internets, on, on the internet. Uh, their personality tests a lot of them and i would say that these are not things to spend a lot of money and time on um, unless you really need a personality test because the problem with these sorts of measures is that personality tests are a snapshot of right now when you take the test and they can be gamed quite often you can kind of under you can kind of feel in many instances on these tests the sort of answer that you need to give to be successful um, and they also are only a snapshot in time for that day and time. And how you feel that day and all the factors in your life at that very moment affect the personality test. So they're good for the spur of the moment snapshot, but I don't think they're good to put away in a file and use for the future. Um, so I would sort of take uh, those sorts of things with a grain of salt. Um, now, when it comes to interest in inventories, we're talking about keeping track of the likes and dislikes of your workforce. Again, that basic information you wanna gather beyond just simple demographics. Um, it allows you to make promotion and planning decisions. It helps you get the best person job fit again. And you'll know, for instance, when looking to hire internally, which employees are maybe already interested in which departments because you run a survey and you've entered the information and you can look it up when you really need it later. Uh, again, there are software programs to help you out with this. Depends on if your company can afford it. Depends on if you could easily just create it yourself by creating a spreadsheet. You certainly can do those sorts of things. Now we do other things like experience and training uh, ratings. This is something that gives some credit for or places value on some previous experience that, or training you've had. Often military veterans, when they go into a job are given some preference or some extra plus because they may have had something in that field or an associated field. And the fact that they've done a job successfully for a number of years in the military means they know how to work as a team, they know how to take orders, they know how to do a mission. And so that's one of the reasons why a little bit of extra is sometimes given to people for experience and so forth. So companies will and agencies will often uh, give preference 
who have a little bit of experience or expertise. It, it simply makes sense. Now you can give structured oral exams. This would be an interview format type of thing. You could do it in singly. You could do it in a panel or a couple people. It could be with structured questions that are always the same every time. Uh, but they ought to be, whatever the format is, very specific to finding out if the applicants have the proper KSOCs or not. All the answers would be rated. All the applicants would receive the same questions. And this is really done a lot in the public sector because they want to show that they're fair and equitable in everything they do in the public sector, certainly. They are the government. Um, work sample performance tests. This might be just a demonstration that you can do the job. You might be required to write something, to do something, demonstrate in some way. Um, for instance, uh, to get into college, sometimes you have to write an essay, right? Um, when I came here to be hired uh, for the very first time, to, make, uh, to get hired for the tenure track position from a part-timer, I had to do two public lectures in front of committees and anybody who wanted to show up as part of the application process. And so these are the things that uh, you do. Um, and they do help you eliminate the, the people who don't belong and find the people that you do want. Now you can do group discussions and so forth, like uh, it says here, leaderless and so forth. These are a little more complicated. This is not something that we really need to, to dwell on. Um, certainly assessment centers are something we should know about. But what are assessment centers? They're really just locations established by local government or federal government or state government or something where activities like I've been discussing are taking place and where you can get support and, and resources and tools and advice. And so these might be areas that you could use uh, for physical testing and online testing areas and things like that. Now, biodata is not medical biodata. Um, this is biographical data. This is uh, gathering information about family history, education, interests, social activities, hobbies, attitudes, like I've been talking about, but it just simply does not include biological data. So let's remember, biodata is biographical data. And it's okay to gather that, but you can't be too pushy with this also, because some people really do uh, feel that maybe you're prying too much, you're getting into my privacy, and uh, you will find that not all individuals are gonna wanna take all your personal interest surveys and so forth, don't let that get you down. Uh, we all have uh, the ways that we look at these sorts of things, but it's to their own detriment within an organization if they don't contribute some information that could really lead to their own promotion or advancement within an organization. So the individuals would decide what they're gonna tell you and how much of it. Now, drug testing is an interesting screening and selecting technique. It's not done as much as it used to be. It, it definitely, uh, won't be done as much as in the private sector as it used to be or the nonprofit. It may still be in the public sector depending on public safety jobs uh, and things like that. Um, but it's usually done to ensure on the job safety and it's usually pre-employment. Uh, organization policies in the different sectors, even within the sectors are going to vary. These tests are not free. And so there's an expense associated for the organization that wants to drug test everyone. Um, so let me show you something here, a quick little um, article. Now, weed is pretty common today, and about two-thirds of the states have either passed medical marijuana or legalized it entirely. Now, this has been a problem of dealing with the slow conversion to legality in marijuana, right? Because people are allowed to get medical marijuana cards, they would have it in their bloodstream. Um, it's not illegal. Um, maybe smoking marijuana wouldn't be legal in the state, but medically it's okay if you've gone through the procedure and have a card. So what does a company do if they do regular drug testing? Uh, do they fire you because the policy says you've exceeded their mandates or not? And people do get fired still today. Walmart had a policy for the longest time. I'm not sure if, it, sure if it's still current, that regardless of the state law in any particular location or, or, or who it is, an employee had a medical card who tested uh, positive for marijuana was going to lose their job. So this is an area of confusion for HR, right? You have to do uh, what is appropriate in your state, what your organization thinks appropriate and so forth. At the same time, 
you have to remember people's rights. So it's an interesting uh, problem right now, you might say, and so forth. Um, but it is out there, and as you can see, legalization of rec recreational marijuana is gaining support uh, all over the country. Um, even here in Missouri, um, there is now medical clinics, and you may have seen them recently popping up all over the place. Now, there are a variety of other tests and selection techniques, honesty and integrity tests. Those are legal. Two types of honesty tests. Um, the overt one, the one that you can really see, uh, they're basically questions they ask you about truthfulness, your attitudes towards theft, your value, uh, how you think about illegal activities, or they may describe something and say, what's your reaction to that? Um, and that will tell them something about you, how you respond in these sorts of things. Um, when it comes to uh, lie detector exams and so forth, uh, they're not legal. If you're involved uh, in interstate commerce, which is generally the private sector, uh, and there was a polygraph, an Employee Polygraph Protection Act passed back in the 80s that sort of protected people from lie exams. Um, but really, when you're doing things like honesty tests or even con contemplating a lie detector exam, which you can't, um, you're really looking to identify counterproductive work behaviors and attitudes that people might have. The bad attitude, the authority problem that a person has, they're uh, a person that's very seems compulsive or obsessive, or a person with too much ego, too much of a type A. That's definitely not what people are looking for in employment these days. Um, and so these sorts of things are legal in the public and nonprofit sectors. Um, there are some limitations on honesty tests uh, and integrity tests, depending on the state. Um, and so generally, uh, depending on where you go to work as an HR manager, you'll know these sorts of things and you'll follow along. But generally, these aren't really needed uh, unless we're talking about public safety jobs, law enforcement types of positions. Now, physical ability tests are common. They've been out there forever, but they absolutely have to be related to the case socks on the job. If they say you need to carry 40 pounds, occasionally lift and move it and, and so forth, then they may ask you to demonstrate that but they shouldn't be able to ask you to do that if that never comes up in the job. So we just have to be smart about that. Now, the more specific the job and the more specialized skills that we have to have, the more specific uh, case ops we're gonna find. So policemen, firefighters, corrections officers, things like that are certainly going to have a lot more going on than others. Uh, in the past, there used to be height and weight requirements for those sorts of things. Um, but it's been proven over time that those sorts of requirements really adversely affect protected groups like women who might be shorter or, or, or whatever, or other groups that we know can do the physical equivalents but don't meet the certain standards. Um, and then you can have something like an in-basket exercise, which you may know about. This is something we generally give top executives uh, and so forth. We give them a variety of materials like memos, uh, a priority list of tasks, the strategic plan, some letters, an appointment schedule, and we throw it at them and say, what do you do first? How do you handle it? And what trade-offs do you make? And these can be difficult, but they really find out if you know how to be a, a, a top-level manager or not. And so you'd be given a, a variety of things. Now, pre-employment, uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, employers are permitted to ask applicants about their ability to perform the job functions, that's okay. But they can't ask about disabilities before a job offer's been made. So whether it's obvious or not, you can't ask about a disability until you've offered them a job. Now this is a key point, and so you want to be careful you don't violate it. Um, now medical exams, these are procedures or tests, right? They seek information about the existence, nature, or severity of any individual's physical, mental impairments, or they're trying to seek information regarding an individual's physical or psychological health. You, you, you simply can't require it. Uh, you can't do that. Um, you can ask them but, uh, um, about some things, but not until you've made that job offer, particularly about the disability. So a physical agility or fitness test, you demonstrate that you can do something, a 
a job simulated related task, those aren't medical uh, examinations. So an agility test would be okay. Psychological examinations like the aptitude test, personality test I talked about, honesty tests, IQ tests, if they're related to the case ox for the job, they're okay to do. Now, when it comes to interviews, quite often, this is where we make our selection. This is where we decide. Um, and so often interviews uh, determine really who's going to get hired for that position. Uh, unfortunately, many HR managers aren't very well trained in interviewing, and it's one of the most important tools or skills that they need to know. Um, interviews are often done very subjectively, and they're done by poorly trained interviewers. And they, they don't realize that there is an art to it, that there's a professional side to it, and that there are different techniques that you can use, such as one or two person or panel interview and so forth. But you can do it different ways. Um, you certainly uh, can use a rating scale. Um, these require some planning and structure, how you're going to do it. But when you're interviewing, you, you really need trained interviewers. And you need to have well-designed questions ready that you pretty much give everyone. Um, your focus has to be, again, on the case ox for the job. And the interview is your biggest tool, probably. And you should use it in consideration with all the other factors of selection that you've used uh, to come up with. Because not everyone interviews well. So keep in mind, people get nervous, anxious, and you may have the ideal candidate, and they really want that job. Or they're just nervous, or something has happened that morning, or they didn't, eat, didn't have breakfast, you know? Um, you need to be savvy about your thinking and intuitive. Um, and so consider all the factors. And, and if you really have a wonder about that, why not consider a short informal in follow-up interview to find out? Um, because maybe steadiness is a quality you're looking for in the job, but maybe it really doesn't matter. So take a little bit of time to be great at your job. There are always these testing issues I've been alluding to as I've talked through this. Um, employment tests that measure your ability to think, these are a little bit controversial. Uh, and sometimes they do rever uh, um, result in some adverse impact on a protected class. So keep that in mind. Do you really need to do an intelligence or cognitive test that measures thinking and ability? You should know from the information you gather that someone has the skills or not. You don't necessarily need to try and measure their intelligence. Um, and, and we do see that state and local governments have often gone through numerous lawsuits over these issues uh, around this sort of thing. They found themselves mired in controversy over paper and pencil tests and so forth, different ways of administering tests that work out to be not favorable to some protected group. And that is one thing about an, uh, an HR manager's job. Be aware of who those protected groups are, uh, that you, you don't want to cause inverse impact, certainly. Um, and so what is a protected group? Just review, well, it's women. Any group that has laws and protections uh, and so forth is generally protected. Minors, people under 18, children are a protected group. Ethnicities of all types are protected group. Gay people are protected groups uh, and, and so forth. Um, and so why do we use tests anyway? Um, well, sometimes uh, today it's the sheer number of applicants and, and it's simply a fantastic elim, uh, a way to eliminate the candidates that don't measure up. Um, but there are, there are all these other things that I've been talking about to do that. And so testing may or may not be something you want to do. It's time consuming. It can cost you. And you may be able to get good candidates, that good PE fit, without doing a lot of testing. It just simply depends on the job. Um, and so Organizations get in this fix where they have to distinguish amongst uh, a large pool of applicants. And so they, they are forced to develop very formal objective methods of doing the screening and grouping and selecting the various applicants. So that's why resumes and vitas are fed into the database and software programs are used and so forth. It's just dealing with reality. When we talk about how we measure things, well, we're really talking about anything in research if it's going to be, in particular, quantitative, it's got to have reliability and it's got to have validity. Now, reliability is easy to define. It's just 
consistency of measurement. You do it the same way every time, the same manner. It's a proven manner. It's, a, it's an accepted and tested manner. That's reliability. Validity is a little bit different because it has a, a few elements to it. But really, validity is asking us, uh, and this is in terms of the testing we're giving, the things we're asking, the information we're gathering. We want to really use this sort of approach. Um, does, uh, is the test or the selection instrument measuring what it's intended to measure? Um, in other words, uh, does the content reflect the essential things, the case socks that are needed for the job? Uh, when it comes to the criteria, uh, are they really related to performance on the job? What you're measuring? Are you measuring the right things? And then the construct validity. Um, you're really looking at the tools and selection instruments you're using and saying, are these the right one? Um, do they really help us? Are they making sense? In other words, do I really need to give a cognitive test or not? Do I need to do this other physical test? Well, that's the things you should be thinking about. Um, and now let's move on to practical intelligence. This is really an interesting concept. It diverges a little bit from the selection and recruiting things I've been talking about, but it, it's something that you wanna keep in mind because you will be looking for these sorts of things in your candidates. And so this is just something to help you find the best people and understand what is best in people. Um, we got the idea of practical uh, intelligence. Let me go back. I thought it showed his picture here. Um, Sternberg is who we got this from, and he proposed that uh, there are three types of intelligences that make up our human thinking processes. Um, and there are many different theories like this. Uh, analytical intelligence, the ability to analyze makes sense. But when you analyze, you're evaluating ideas, you're solving problems, you're making decisions. Creative intelligence, uh, this is a, involving going beyond uh, what is given to generate novel and interesting ideas uh, to be innovative, really. Um, practical intelligence, hands-on, really. When I think of the word practical, I'm really thinking of hands-on. What can I do with this, this information? Well, practical intelligence is the ability that individuals use to find the best fit between themselves and the demands of their work environment. And so in other words, do I have the right skills for the job? Should I even apply for this job? Um, and as the HR manager, you'll be looking at that and you'll be thinking, that person is not right for this job. Why did they apply? Well, you're really thinking in terms of practical intelligence when you, you look at it this way. Um, Sternberg really called these three intelligences uh, these three abilities, successful intelligence. So if you're average or better in any of these sorts of things, you're probably going to be a candidate uh, if you have some skills in a certain area uh, to get hired. And what, what successful intelligence means is that you've got an integrated set of abilities according to Stern, uh, Sternberg. And these integrated set of abilities, these three types of intelligences uh, will help you attain success, help you as an HR manager pick the right people and so forth. And, and that's really what it's all about, doing a good job. This is a way to identify people and, and even in yourself. Tacit knowledge, Sternberg here. Uh, let's see, is that Robert Sternberg? Let me go back a second. Is that the same guy? It is Robert Sternberg. Okay, so this is what he looks like. Um, he's a psychologist, um, really. Um, and along with this notion of these three types of intelligences is the notion of tacit knowledge. Now, tacit knowledge uh, is how we measure this notion of the practical intelligent. Tacit, hands-on, is the way I think of tacit, just like I think of the word practical, leads me to think of a practical, a hands-on application for some information, something like that. So tacit knowledge is difficult to express in words. He says that there are three types, and you can see them here, the procedural, the learned, and knowledge about things. This is how we understand tacit knowledge. Now, procedural uh, is rather, um, when things are procedural, it, we're not talking about the facts, we're talking about the activity, the operation. It's the knowledge of how to do something rather than knowledge about something. 
you may not know how something works or the theoretical concepts behind it, but you know exactly the process of how it operates when you make something or use it. Um, and so we have all kinds of procedural knowledge in our lives that we do when not understanding the greater details of, of what we're working with, but we understand how to go about it. Um, learn knowledge. Um, this is something that we get with or without the help of others or explicit instruction. Um, learned knowledge is education, training, and so forth. And then we have knowledge about things. Uh, these are things that, it's knowledge, let me put it that way, that we acquire in the experience of our life. We learn things. And sometimes the things we learn about certain topics don't match up with what people, other people learn about the same things. And so that's what makes the human condition interesting. And uh, our knowledge about things is constantly exchanged with other people and so forth. Well, if you know these sorts of basis of intelligence and understanding how people think and so forth, you will be a much better HR manager. You'll do better in particular when you start looking for the right people. A lot of times companies, organizations in all three sectors are looking for people who can adapt. These are the ideal candidates in so many positions and in so many professions. People who are responsible uh, or responsive, people who are flexible. That's what the word adaptability means. People who are maybe creative in the right situation. If you're adaptable, there is certainly a cultural element that comes in. You need to be culturally adaptable in today's world. And, and I would say that is a must for any HR manager to understand diversity well, understand culture and how it affects us and be aware because you have to adapt constantly because we do have such an incredibly diverse workforce today in our country. We've got to be able to, out of all this knowledge, develop good communication skills. And, you know, of course, that are appropriate to whatever job or sector we're working in. In other words, just like it says, we've got to adapt to our environment. Now, the idea of multiple intelligences is another way to look at this sort of idea of how do people think? How can I see some of these things and use it to help me? Well, we got the idea in the 80s from Dr. Gardner. He was at Harvard, of course. Um, and he says, well, one way to look at people and uh, to find things out in areas uh, and to categorize them in areas that are useful to you um, is these types of intelligences here. And so I think it's a fascinating way to view an intelligence. And I think if you look at this list here, you can see things in yourself you're strong in and things that you might be weak in. I look at it and I say, okay, word smart, probably average, maybe above average, because I've got a good vocabulary, I'm educated, but at the same time, I'm not bilingual. So it, it's, there's a, le a limit there. Uh, math, probably average at best. Spatial intelligence, pretty good. I've been an artist uh, all my life, and pen and ink, things like that. Body smart, oh, not so much. Music smart, yeah. I've been a drummer for 60 years. I think I know something about that, but I wouldn't say I could be music smart and other things. So we can all identify things here that we are strong and we can. And if you're thinking in these terms, you can use it as a very valuable tool to find out things that maybe are needed in your particular organization that make a good fit. And here's just a graphic that I like so much because it laid out those eight intelligences, uh, intelligences in such a nice uh, logical way. Um, and you can see them all here. And so we're all, you know, I don't, I don't know of anyone that's uh, fantastic in all eight. I've never met a person that incredibly brilliant. I'm sure they're out there. Um, I'm not one of them. <laughs> now this emotional intelligence uh, is another way to look at how we think and act. And emotional intelligence is a sort of an interactive thing because you're going to be looking inwards to see where do you fit. And you're also going to be applying some of the thinking of this uh, to other people as you look at them and try and understand what's going on. So like it says here, um, it is the ability identify and manage your own emotions, know where you're strong, where you're weak. And then when you could do that, when you do have that some level of self-awareness, you can actually more ac uh, accurately start to see some of that stuff in other people. So emotional intelligence is just like it says, 
you harness your emotions, apply them to the right way, uh, the right tasks, thinking and problem solving in particular, uh, harness your drive, your energy, your ambition, your tension, whatever it might be. Uh, but it also, if you get aware enough of yourself and understand, you'll have a somewhat of an epiphany and you will be able to see how the things you say and do and look at influence other people. And so you can kind of see how the cycle works there. It's not necessary to remember this, but it's the broad concepts I'm going for here rather than all these incredible details I'm throwing on you. Social intelligence. You can see here, this gets a little complicated. We're in psychology heavily here. Carl Albrecht, I think Dr. Albrecht, um, talks about social insight, uh, intelligence, I should say. And, and really what he's saying here is when you look at people, realize that behavior is on a continuum. And it makes sense that at one continuum of behavior is the most terrible, toxic behavior you can imagine that you can't interact with people that you can't be around, who cannot be in your organization, do not fit. On the other end of the continuum, it makes sense that you would have people that are the best to work with, the most engaging, the most collaborative, and indeed the most nourishing. So that's one way to look at people in general in social intelligence. Where do they fit in that overall continuum of, of human behavior and expression? Are they more on the toxic side or are they more on the nourishing side? I would say that none of us are stuck in one point. I, I don't think, I would hope not all the time, unless you're stuck on the far right in the nourishing, that would be fantastic. But I think we change. I think we change throughout our lives. We can get better if we're saying maybe we're not the person that we wanna be. Uh, we can improve ourselves and move our behavior and our social intelligence, our social expression more to one way um, and so we can grow and learn is really what I'm saying here. Um, but social intelligence at the end of the day is really about finding that spot in this continuum of behavior where you, where you can get along well with others, where you can get them to cooperate with you. And this is what we refer to as people skills. So it's an awareness of situations and social dynamics. Uh, it's, a no, it's a knowledge of interaction styles and strategies that can help you achieve your objectives when you deal with other people. And as like I've said, it involves that certain amount of self insight and consciousness of your own reactions or perceptions and so forth. Um, so toxic behavior is what we want to get away from because it makes people feel devalued and angry and frustrated or otherwise not happy right? And the nourishing behavior is the opposite. It does make you feel more valued and uh, more respected and affirms why you're doing the things that you do. Generally, uh, I don't think it would be any surprise to say that we would view nourishing behaviors as indicators of high social intelligence. Oops. See if I can get my share back. I have technical difficulties occasionally. Um, let's see if I can get this lower right slide. There we go. Um, executive and managerial recruitment selection. Really haven't said anything about different types of levels of management and so forth. I've just been talking about employees in general. Um, we do a little bit different, uh, a lot more work, a little bit more specific things when we're hiring, when we're hiring top management or people to run agencies and things like that. Particularly, as you can see in the public sector here at federal and state levels, it's a lot more difficult to describe the job components of these executive level positions. Uh, and if you want executive uh, selection to be successful, you need to study it and be well versed in it and so forth, because it's a little bit different and you're gonna be looking at different things and in different places. Um, so for this to be successful, organizations must invest time and effort to recognize all those interrelationships among individual behavior and managerial skill and effectiveness and style, organizational success, and the things that you want and need from your executives or your leaders. 
And so you just simply must plan your search process uh, accordingly. We aren't going to go into any depth on that. Um, and it's the same way in large nonprofits and so forth, the same thing for local governments and so forth. Um, and you should actually be doing the same things in the private sector when you hire CEOs and presidents and things like that. Okay, let me wrap this up for you. Um, when we do our recruitment selection, it's got to be with strategic intent. This reaffirms why you are there as a department and the contributions that your department can make. Um, public agencies, they have to look at what they're doing, make sure they've got the best people, they've got to uh, make adjustments as they go, like it says here. Um, and you really need to adopt all the things, uh, the practices, policies, use the tools that will get you the most qualified applicants, use uh, the techniques and things I've talked about here. And don't get bogged down, don't waste your time. Use only the screening and testing and selection techniques that you absolutely need. And only the ones that are going to get you the best people and really will predict whether or not people will do well on the job. Okay, folks, that's all for this time. I'll talk to you again soon.